um, my mum is from Thailand. My father is British. Um, I was born in England, but I spent a lot of time in my early years uh, in Thailand. Um, I went to kindergarten there. So yeah, that's kind of my background. And in terms of my job, uh, I'm an actor and a model and I own my own well-being consultancy business as well. Yeah, so I think, you know, the reason I started this and it, I never set out or intended to start a business. It happened very organically uh, over the lockdown period, really. Um, I started getting into it and it came from a place of just sharing my story online about who I was and the journey that I've been on since I was a kid in terms of finding myself and discovering health, well-being and fitness through that and transforming my life into being in a place where I feel very comfortable in my skin and you know it's been a very long journey trying to navigate all of those challenges around body image uh, what it is to be a man in society right now what it is to be a uh, ethnic minority in society today and you know what we want to put out is making people in the workplace in schools in education really be in tune with who they are and really get to know themselves and feel comfortable and beautiful in their skin, no matter what gender they are. And we do that through a lot of solution based work. We go into companies, organizations, schools, and I'll deliver keynotes or talks. Um, we deliver workshops on a load of different topics such as men's health, body image, women's health, menopause, uh, nutrition, uh, being vulnerable, uh, leadership, people and culture. And we just try to recenter those organizations to really start thinking in a people centric way. And yeah, it's been a, it's been a really great journey so far. And uh, I definitely, you know, for me, it's all about hitting those three E's. We want to educate, we want to empower and we want to entertain people. I got into acting in the craziest of ways. Okay, so, you know, you hear people and they'll say stories around, you know, they got spotted in the street and they got scouted. That kind of happened to me in the weirdest of ways. I was going through a very difficult time in my life um, in regards to my own body image and I was having a lot of health issues. And, you know, growing up, I wanted to do two jobs. I either wanted to be a marine biologist because I love the ocean and I, I love sharks uh, <laughs> or I wanted to be a journalist just because I've spent my whole life writing. I've been journaling since I was a kid and I just love expressing myself through creative writing. Um, so I moved to London. I did an internship in PR and I was very lucky enough to be able to go to London Film Festival. And I went to the premiere of a movie called Quartet, which was the directorial directorial debut of Dustin Hoffman and in the press conference afterwards I got scouted by Dustin Hoffman uh, he said I had a face for camera and uh, that kind of kick-started my career never in a million years would I have thought I'd be entering this kind of lifestyle I never saw myself as an actor or model and yeah from there opportunities came and uh, yeah I've been very blessed to I've worked around the world, um, lived in many different places, was, worked with some really great names. And uh, yeah, in terms of the who I am and my identity, it has played a, a big part in forming who I am now and trying to navigate those things, especially as a young kid. You know, I, I got into that at 18, straight fresh out of college. And I was still trying to find myself, you know, it's, I'm still a teenager and you're still trying to figure out who you are in this life and in this universe, and you kind of layer that with the body image stuff, you layer that with my ethnic identity, and just trying to figure out who I was, you know, I never grew up with Asian representation in my life, when I was looking on TV, or the very limited number of characters that there were, they were very stereotyped, marginalized, you know, they were the very dorky, smart, techie people, um, or they were almost like the 
the strict um, kind of family culture. So I never really knew many people I could identify with when I was growing up watching TV. And that did play a part in when I started to get into the industry and I started to go for roles, I actually noticed that actually there wasn't many roles of Southeast Asian representation. A lot of the roles I was going for were uh, very Hispanic looking, very European looking, um, which plays into a whole other ball game of, you know, this, this I, I call it the lost identity of people who are ethnically ambiguous. And I kind of had my challenges and experiences growing up that I almost was like a shapeshifter that I could, you know, go into different social circles and almost be a part of that social circle. But I never truly found my own identity because I wasn't as connected to that culture because I, because I wasn't. Um, and yeah, it, it did play a part in terms of my career and, you know, how do I market myself and how do my team and agencies and managers market me? And I remember being out in Asia working. I was in, you know, I spent a lot of time in Asia working and kind of the, the, the symbolism of just not knowing my identity came with, was when I was going for a casting for a Caucasian person. I turned up at the casting and the casting director said, you know what, you are not Caucasian looking enough. And it was like a week later or a couple of days later, I was going to another casting and they were looking for an Asian person and I turned up and the casting director said, you don't look Asian enough. And I was like, okay, <laughs> um, you know, I am 50% Caucasian, I'm 50% Asian, but both of those cohorts of people don't want me. So, so where does that leave me? And, and that kind of taught me to, okay, well, actually, who am I? And that was my journey to discover who I was and what my identity was. Yeah, it's it's been both pros and cons, as I've said, you know, I think when you are almost that, that shapeshifter, that chameleon, you can play it to your advantage because I'm not put into a box, you know, I'm not pigeonholed in that way. Um, so I could, you know, a lot of the time I was going for a lot of European um, roles. I was going for a lot of Latin America, Hispanic roles, and I still do to this day um, because there isn't the Asian representation out there. There just isn't the opportunities out there, which, you know, I'm hoping and trying to campaign and push for more. Um, so it has helped me in that regard is just being ethnically ambiguous has its pros and cons that you can almost fit into different social circles in terms of culture and um, race, but it hinders you because first of all, you don't know yourself. You, you don't know your identity because people are telling you to kind of go here and here and here. Well, actually, you know, is that me or, you know, is that true to who I am? And yeah, it just, uh, I think then you almost get pigeonholed into other categories and you think, well, actually, you know, I'm going for all of these roles, um, but that's not even who I am. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even Spanish or um, looking or whatever. So yeah, it definitely has its pros and cons. And uh, I think, you know, it's helped a lot in terms of my career, but I think it's definitely hurt me mentally. Like I said, at the, the top of the call, I've been on this transformative journey into knowing who I am and you know how I can feel very comfortable in myself and in my own skin. I think growing up, you know, when you're watching television, we're very influenced by the media and what we see online or on TV. And when you're looking at stereotypes or what society pushes on to you in terms of imagery and narrative that does have an effect on how you see yourself you know i grew up surrounded by tv shows that would always show you know it would be the the hot young athletic guys in high school who would be on the football team or the lacrosse team and they would be 
the ones who are really popular and dating, you know. And actually, you know, when we talk around race, none of those guys were of an ethnic um, origin. You know, they were mainly predominantly white men. And that's how I saw, okay, well, if you want people to be interested in you, you want people to like you, then you have to get into like, this kind of shape. You have to be this type of person. And it did. It really had an effect on me mentally because that's kind of what I strive for, you know, because all I had seen of people who looked like me were, you know, we were the cleaners, we were the restaurant owners, we were the geeks, we were like the losers club. And, you know, I, in a way, I didn't want to be that. And I wanted to be this guy up here. So, you know, I really strived to, to be like that person to get in shape. And what happened, you know, I ended up with an eating disorder, ended up with a lot of body image issues because of the pressures that were coming all around me. And I didn't feel content in terms of who I was. I, growing up, I was very resistant against my heritage. Um, you know, my mom suffered some racial abuse. I suffered some racial abuse at the time when I was growing up. And I'm from, you know, quite a small town in, in rural England, predominantly white. And, you know, nobody knew where Thailand was on the map. It wasn't this tourist destination like it is now. And we're only going back like what, 20 years ago. Um, and, and yeah, you know, it was, it was really tough. And I think, you know, I didn't want to be associated with being Thai. I stopped speaking Thai to my mom. I would tell her to only speak English to me. And I almost disassociated myself from that identity. Looking back, yeah, I feel so sorry for that kid who did that, you know, and I, I, uh, I kind of wish it, it never happens because you should be embracing your culture. But when you're made to feel like you're inferior to other people, it can be really, you know, those things can leave scars. And I see it with other people, younger people growing up now. You know, I remember a couple of years ago, I had a, a Filipino woman and she had two daughters and they must have been around six years old. And she came up to me and she asked me around my experiences growing up because her daughters were experiencing some bullying, uh, racial bullying at school. And she said, you know, how, how hard was it for you growing up? And I said, you know, it was tough. And, you know, and this was just a couple of years ago. So it's still so sad to see that we haven't progressed that much um, in terms of Southeast Asian um bullying and crimes, you know, I think we still have a long way to go because there just isn't the voices there. There just isn't the, the mainstream campaigning there for it. One of the most powerful things is giving people somebody to relate to. That's what I've found in, in all of my time doing this, the feedback that I get is that giving somebody out there someone to relate to giving them a connection to somebody is much more powerful than being able to give a load of stats and figures i think when you can talk around a personal lived experience and it's not just my own experience you know we work with loads of other people um, from who can cover a range of topics all around personal experience and speaking their own truth in, in a way that is really brave honest I think that that resonates and that hits so much harder. So that's how we try to get the message across to people. We'll go into organizations and you know we'll talk for our own truth and we'll talk around the experiences that we face, not just in schools or organizations, but in the workplace. And you know that that almost gives those employees or those students somebody that they're able to say, wow, okay, I am not going through this alone. There is somebody out there who I can identify with. There's somebody out there who went through the same things as me. And, you know, giving them, giving them a beacon of hope, I think, just to say that, you know, we've been through this and, you know, we've come out the other end and it does get better. And, you know, these are the resources and support systems that are in place that we used you know, maybe you should use them too, because maybe you're not aware of them. And there's also an education piece for 
employers um, and leaders just to be able to talk around the experiences that people within their organization are going through because they may not be privy to that because they've not come from that type of background you know whether that is through you know what your what your race is what your sexuality is you know your culture or your body shape it's about creating an educational piece to create understanding and awareness and you know we do that through storytelling and then we back that storytelling up with fact I always admit that, you know, I want to be fact checked on the things that I say. So we come up with that our front line is the storytellers. And then behind that, you know, that robust, we, we work with a lot of psychologists, clinicians, you know, nutritionists um, who can really fact check us and say, well, actually, OK, it's part of this story. This is the evidence. And these are the things that are going to help. You know, I'm, I've never been more in tune with, you know, who I am as a person today. And especially I embrace uh, my Thai culture and my Thai heritage. You know, I would probably say and, you know, maybe some of my, my closest friends would say I'm probably more Thai than British. Um, even though growing up, like I said, I disassociated myself with that. Um, but, you know, I'm I love Thailand. I go back, you know, I try to go back at least once or twice a year uh, my parents live in Thailand you know I have family there now so I'll go see them um, you know I'm always connected um, with with my Thai roots you know I have a really great social circle um, here in the UK with a load of Thai friends and you know there are a lot of childhood friends and you know we'll try to speak Thai to each other when we can we'll talk around Thailand you know I love cooking Thai food as well so you know, every weekend without fail, usually uh, I'll cook Thai food. So, you know, on a Saturday night, if you come over to mine, then it's usually Thai food that we're having. And yeah, you know, for me, I still try to keep up the language. It was something that, you know, I did speak fluent Thai when I was a kid and then I kind of stopped speaking it. And, you know, in the past mm, six years or so, I've really made a conscious effort to get back into talking Thai um, so when I go to Thailand, I, I talk Thai wherever I can. Um, here, I try to talk Thai wherever I can. So I'm, you know, really connected around my Thai culture. And again, part of the work that we do uh, with Tommy Hatter Online is we'll go into organizations and I'll talk around the Thai culture. I'll talk around Southeast Asia. I'll talk around Buddhism. Um, and, you know, that's how I can keep that connection with, you know, my, that side of my heritage. Ah, what do I love most about Songkra? I think, you know, it's just a celebration. I think it's just a really joyous celebration. Um, you know, for people who don't know too much about Songkra, so it is the Thai New Year. Um, although they do celebrate the, the New Year that we all come to know and love, which is on the 31st of December, 1st of January. But, you know, within the Thai Buddhist calendar, Songkra is um, the 13th to the 15th. Um, it's usually mid-April, the dates change, um, but it's a big celebration. And, and what is centered around that is water. Um, there's another festival, um, Loi Kratong, which is celebrated in November time, and that's centered around water too. So water is really uh, kind of fundamental to the Thai culture. But what we do in Songkran is, you know, it's just loads of food, you know, as you could imagine, you know, Thai people love their food, Asian people love their food. Um, so there's just loads of dishes everywhere. And, you know, where the water plays in is typically if you go to Thailand or in Songkran, um, there's just water fights in the streets. You know, you could be walking along. You may be wanting to go to the local shopping center and somebody is going to throw a bucket of water over you. Um, and it is just mayhem. You know, it, it it's so fun. It's just so joyous. It's crazy. It's a bit hectic. But it's just kind of a big party and, you know, it's just a big water fight in the street. So, you know, I, I love Songkran for that reason. Um, I'm going to hold my hands up. I've never actually been to Thailand during Songkran, but, uh, you know, we'll try to do what we can to celebrate it here. Yeah, you know, it's uh, I always try to, like I said, you know, I love cooking and I love cooking Thai food. So usually every Songkran, uh, I'll cook big feast um, of Thai food and 
in you know and that's just the way to celebrate it would be kind of it would be a bit lunacy i'd probably get arrested if i went out into the street and you know threw through water over somebody <laughs> um but uh yeah you know it's it's about playing the small parts so i'll just cook a lot of thai food and you know we'll pay our respects in terms of the new year there and celebrate it within the intimacy of you know a very close social circle and within my own home and then yeah in terms of the communities that happen there's quite a few that you know the uk has a big thai community although you probably wouldn't know it if you weren't within those circles but there are always events happening um, around the uk uh, obviously weather permitting um, but yeah you know there's there's things that mark the occasion around that it would be great if we could do more of it and actually get it into mainstream um, because like you said you probably wouldn't know of it um, if you weren't in those social circles. And it would be a really great, I think it's such a really great celebration to be able to start to publicize a little bit more and just give people awareness. There's so many other religious cultures that we talk around, which is fantastic, but it would be good to kind of mark a Buddhist uh, celebration within that as well. You embrace yourself, embrace who you are, it's the thing that makes you unique. You know, when you put everybody in the world together, why would we want to be the same? Um, you know, and it, it's about embracing your culture, your identity, because that's what makes you who you are. And that is your superpower. Your biggest strength is in your individuality. And, you know, I know it's tough. Take it from me. You know, I've, I've spent my teenage years going through this battle of who am I? But actually coming out the other end and you know learning more about myself and what do I value? And where am I in my life to feel comfortable? That's the biggest asset, you know, that's the thing that I take away. And you know, I wish that I didn't spend those years beating myself up around my identity. Actually, I should be leading with who I am and I should be putting my best foot forward and showing the world who I am, um, whether that is in regards to, you know, physically how I look in my body shape or my ethnic race. Um, you know, I think we can all be a little bit kinder to ourselves uh, because the biggest, the biggest thing we're always, we always love to do is be negative around ourselves. And it's so hard to be positive about ourselves, but if we can make those daily steps, and you know it's not an easy journey but we can make those daily steps to be kinder to ourselves whether that is through reading uh, writing our thoughts and feelings affirmations i'm a huge fan of affirmations but i think just around knowing ourselves better and, and loving yourself embrace who you are and other people will start to embrace you too